All right, Booker Tov. Today's stuff is Ayin Aleph 71. And we pick up with the mission on the top of Ayin Aleph. Uh, we'd be dealing with the last few dapim with the whole issue about uh, when do you have to, if you leave uh, wine with a non Jew unattended, you, can you assume, uh, you need to uh, be concerned that the non Jew touched the wine or in other ways handled it, um, or if you're popping in and out, or he's afraid you'll come back at any time, or any or situations such as that, um, can you be confident that uh, he did not touch it, um, or confident enough anyway, so that the wine would be fine? With this mission, we return to some earlier themes um, having to do with. Um, um, getting benefit from the wine, uh, and uh, and yeah, what stage is the wine considered uh, belonging um, to the non-Jew, and when is it considered like it's your wine, and then you're using it, and you're getting benefit from it, and so on. So let's take a look at the Mishnah, and actually somewhat surprisingly or inter appropriately, uh, one aspect of this is going to very much tie in to uh, something uh, chametz related, as we've also seen issues before about how do you define bittel? Is it the majhu? There was a whole side discussion about chametz. So uh, recognizing that Pesach is just around the corner, we'll see an interesting chametz tie in in a minute as well. All right, let's start with the Mishnah. So here you have some Jewish workers and it was time to get paid, and their non-Jewish uh, boss, uh, the owner of the company, said, oh, I don't have any cash on me, but here, take some wine. So what's their story? By the way, the simple sense here, I mean, there's been an ongoing discussion whether ye nesach means literally ye nesach or stam ye nam, and one would assume by context here, he's not dafka sending them wine that he poured to Avodah Zara. Anyway, one way or another, he, um, it, even stam ye nam is also behana, you can't get benefit. So here he is, he sends them this wine. So obviously they can't take it, they can't get benefit from it. What are they supposed to do? So the Mishnah says, Utar lomar lo, lomar tein lanu estameha. Okay, they can say, uh, give us, you know, give, give, you know, we don't accept the wine for payment. Give us cash. That they can do because the wine is not yet theirs. So they're not selling the wine or benefiting the wine. They're refusing the wine for payment. And they're saying, we'd like you to pay us with cash instead. Once, however, they take possession of the wine, they can't go back and say, actually, we'd like to swap this wine for money. Then it becomes their wine, and then they're actually by giving it back to the owner and asking for money and instead they're essentially sell, selling yein nesach and getting benefit from yein nesach okay so that seems pretty straightforward let's see the gemara i'm rabbi yudam arav mutar la adam lo marlo with the chavin tseva face alive menas hamelech okay so we're just so we don't even comment on the mission we're just going to deal with a similar case a parallel case uh you owe taxes to the king so you can say to the non-jew would you mind i don't have cash on me right now i don't have anything would you mind maybe he's your partner who knows what he is would you mind paying my taxes for me and i'll reimburse you and then if the non-jew decides to pay the taxes with wine um it's not your wine it's not like it's not like you have to pay the king with your with wine and therefore you're getting benefit from the yay nesa you said pay the king. He chose to pay the taxes with wine, but the effect was was that he paid your ten thousand dollar debt, and you owe him ten thousand dollars. If you remember, we had this issue before, whereas you know you tell the storekeeper pay my workers, um, and if the storekeeper goes ahead and gives them wine to drink, you know give my workers food, he gives them wine to drink, and then he turns to you. So he's not turning to you. It's not your wine he gave them. He's just he's just sending you the bill. You know now you owe him money. Okay, and your relationship to him is just a relationship of paying a debt. Um, so here too, since you didn't ask to, oh, could you pay off my debt and use your wine to pay off my debt, then it would be like an extension of you and like you'd be paying your debt with wine. You just said pay off my debt. And he chose to give the good to, 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 to use wine. So now he's turning to you. It's just a debt now that you owe this a non-Jew, and therefore it's not a problem. Okay, so the Gemara says like this, Mesve, I'll challenge you on this. Al Yomar Adam Lovit Kochavim. Don't say to an Anju, would you please uh, go ahead and take my place, stand in my stead, you know, um, for the Otsar. Rashi right? says Otsar, is, uh, he wants to read that meaning also, some type of a similar tax collector or a officer or so on. That you are um, not allowed to say. So why not? Why can't you say that? You'll pay it with wine and, you know, even if he pays it with wine, no problem. You need to ask him to pay it with wine. So the Gemara says, I'm only Rav. So Rav said back, Oh, Tachtai Lotzar, come out to one minute. That's a different language. There, the language you used is not 
would you mind please, you know, um, uh, paying my taxes for me? You said, there you said, actually take my stead, uh, be in my place. So when you say be in my place, and then he chooses to pay with wine, this is the way Rashi reads it, then because you framed it almost as like, be my shaliach, you know, be my representative. So therefore, when he's choosing to pay with wine, it's like you're choosing to pay with wine. It's like you're giving the wine. And therefore, if the wine is the non-Jews wine, you're giving ye nesech and you're benefiting from ye nesech. So that language, he says, makes all the difference. Okay, Halo Damya, the case Raza that I'm talking about is similar to the other case of the Brighta. Elaha, Avo Omelo Maltaini Minota. You can say, please save me, you know, please save me from the tax collector. That you're allowed to say, okay? And you say, could you, could you please, you know, pay my taxes for me? I'll reimburse you. Could you please save me from the tax collector? And then if the non Jew chooses to pay wine, that's the non Jew's choice. And when he comes to you, he's just coming to you with a bill. Okay, but if you say a language that's very much a shaliach language, be in my stead regarding the taxes, okay, then there, then when he pays with wine is much more like you're paying with wine. That's why Rashi, the Tosfos, I should say, is a little bit, feels like even if you say that language, if it's totally the non, if, if basically all you owe is cash, you will have a $10,000 tax bill, and then then even if you say the language of be in my stead, at the end of the day, right, he's paying a debt of $10,000. And even if he's using wine, it shouldn't matter. So if you look at Tosos, Tosos actually says that even the problematic case is, is, is a much narrower case. Tosos says, I'm sorry, not that one. Okay. Um, so Pia Rabbi Yehuda is saying here, the 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 so then even if, you know, he could have paid money and the non Jew chose to pay wine, when she, if you framed it like you are my representative, do this in my stead, it's like you're paying with wine, even though it was the non Jew's choice. That's the way Rashi reads it. Now, Tosas continues saying, we're in the middle of Tosas, halo damia. So this is the lean, the That does not appear correct. This is then the whole thing would be, first of all, like it's a, it's a stretch to say that case is a problem, and then it would be obvious that when you just said save me, it would be permissible. What tells us wants to say, we're, we're talking in a bigger Kiddush. Actually, you're, you owe wine to the king. Okay, it's not like a $10,000 taxes. It's like, well, you are a percentage of your, you know, annual produce to the king. So if you're in the wine business, you owe 10% of that to the king. You owe the king wine. Okay, now, and therefore, if you say, be in my stead, well, I owe the king wine, pay wine to the king for my debt of wine. So then, and you're the non Jew are going to pay the king with your, with your wine, which is forbidden. Then it's a debt of wine. You're paying with wine. Then it's really like I am using your wine to pay my debt, and it's a problem of Yenessa. Okay, so that all makes a lot of sense, but then there's a tremendous chiddush now in Tosfos. Even though my debt is wine, and the non-Jew is paying wine for me, if I slightly frame it in a different way, save me from my debt, that gets that now allows it. Okay, so he says, Then I'm like basically saying. Look, I know I owe the king wine. Do whatever you have, you can do to get me out of my debt. Bribe him, maybe, maybe get him to pay cash, maybe pay cash instead of wine. If you wind up paying wine, that's also good. Okay, so therefore, so according to Tosos, it's a big chiddush, right? According to Rashi, let me just step back and just say it again. According to Rashi, the case in the Mishnah and the case in the Bright is you owe cash, okay? And you owe cash, you ask the non Jew to pay for you, you'd reimburse the non Jew. So, you know, in the end of the day, you're not paying wine. If the non Jew chooses to pay wine, your debt was cash. Anything he paid with, that's just his choice of what to pay this $10,000 debt with at the end of the day. You just owe the non Jew for the debt of the value of what he paid, but you're, you're not using the wine. Even if that's true, that you just owe cash, and the non Jew is making his own choices about what to pay with, you know, if you frame it as be my representative, be in my stead, old 
then and the Nadu pays wine, it's like you pay wine. So for Rashi, even though the debt is cash and the Nadu is making his own choice, if you frame it in a particular way, it makes it like you paid wine. So that's uh, Chumrah. Tosos makes a much more lenient conclusion. Tosos says if the debt could be a debt of wine, and even if the debt is a debt of wine, and the non-Jew is paying wine, it'll be okay. It's not like you paid wine, as long as you framed it to the non-Jew, not directly pay my debt, then it means pay wine and you're paying wine for me. But as long as you framed it as like something like, get me out of it, try to do whatever you can to, to get me out of my debt, okay, that's enough of a distancing that it even means that even if he, in the end he pays wine, it's not like you paid wine. Okay, so interesting debates of Rashi and Tosos. You might remember that this goes back to that discussion earlier, like when you say to the storekeeper, pay my workers, and the storekeeper pays them in wine, and then he comes back to you. You know, the example I gave in a case of like, you know, you say to somebody, like you say to your employees, you know, go ahead and order whatever you want, you know, and I'll, and you know, and then I'll reimburse you. Or you say to somebody on the street, like go to the restaurant, you know, poor person's asking for money, go order what you want, I'll pay, I'll pay it off. And they order like Basar Bechala, which is Asar Behana, is it like you are benefiting from the bus or the No, they're doing their transaction, and now you just owe the storekeeper money. Okay, so this is very much a continuation of that. According to Rashi, it's not so much of a chiddish because it was just a debt of money to begin with. But Tosus reads it that it could even be a case of a debt of wine being paid with wine and framed the right way. It's not like you were paying the wine. You just owe the non-Jew the money, and the non-Jew did whatever the non-Jew did. Okay, so now we take a look at the next Mishnah. Um, so that was a continue. That was like going back to that issue about when is it that it's like you were you pay you were you, you know like it was like you were you paying using the wine and when was it that no they did what they did and you just owe the money. Now hamocha yeno lobit kochav. Now we're going to get a case not where it's the non-Jew's wine, it's your wine, but you're selling it to the non-Jew. So what you got to do in this case is you have to make sure that the non-Jew doesn't handle it before the sale is final. Because if the non-Jew handles it before the sale is final, it becomes yein nesach, and now you're selling, you can't sell him yein nesach. So you have to sell it to him, and the sale has to be final before he gets a chance to handle it. So let's see how, what the Mishnah says. And this is going to get us into a question, which is when does an, an, a transaction between a Jew and a non-Jew, when does that sale become final? Okay? So, you're selling your wine to a non-Jew. If you basically fix the price, okay, and um, before you measured it out, all right, then um, the... Um, uh, before then, the money is permissible. Okay, so now the question is why? Okay, so um, the easy way to understand this because it doesn't mention when the money changed hands; it just mentions when the price was fixed. Okay, so the simple sense of this is we're not dealing with money changing hands. Money is not what finalizes a transaction with a non-Jew. Okay, Mashiach, the normal things that finalize a transaction between Jew and Jew would finalize a transaction between Jew and non-Jew. Okay, which would be Mashiach, Hagba, those types of things. The only thing is, is that if the price isn't yet fixed, there's not yet enough Gemar Das, right? If I'm measuring it out, like, you know, but I don't yet know how much I'm paying. I mean, this happens to me, you know, sometimes, you know, you go to the cash register ready to pay and you say, wait, what? How much was that about? Oh, whatever. No, forget it. I'm not buying that. Okay. So, you know, so sometimes even after you ring it up, you say, wait, I thought it was whatever. No, take that off. So anyway, so, so if it's Ad Kilo Madad, the Mashiach isn't yet Kona. The Mashiach is only Kona once the price is fixed. Okay. So if the price is fixed and then you measured it into the, you know, to the vessel of the non Jew, you poured the wine into the non Jew's uh, pitcher, whatever it was, then Tamav Mutarim, then it's a good sale and you can keep the money. Okay. Because as soon as the money goes into the non Jew's pitcher, um, the sale is final and the non Jew doesn't handle it until after it went into his, his, into his pitcher. So it only becomes forbidden wine after the sale is final. But Madad Achelo Pasaki, first you measured it and you poured it into the non Jew's picture, and you haven't yet fixed the price, now you got a problem. Because now the non Jew has wine in his picture. Which, which you still own because the price hasn't been fixed yet. And now we're afraid he's going to touch it or whatever and it'll be stam yenam. And now when you say, oh, how much is it? Oh, it's a dollar uh, an ounce or whatever it is. At that moment, that's when the sale becomes final. 
But at that moment, it's already forbidden. It's your, it's, until then, it's your wine, which became stamiena, which you can't sell to the non Jew. Okay? So in that case, madat, ajala pasak, tamava serene, the money is forbidden. All right? So you get the idea? You need the sale to be final before he has a chance to handle it. So as long as the sale is final, when it goes into his vessel, that's a second before he, he has a chance to, to access the vessel, right? Then you're safe. But if when it goes into his vessel, the sale isn't yet final, then it's a problem because then it's still your wine. Now he can touch it and now it's forbidden and now you can't finalize the sale. All right, so let's take a look at the Gemara. Amar Meira, Amemar. Drawing something, an act of Meshicha, similarly to an act of being in his vessel, all the normal types of Kinyanim that have to do with a physical control over or mastery over the object that you are taking possession of. That's like Meshicha, Chaser, Kikli, all those types of things, that's implied by the word Meshicha. So the Meshicha, those types of taking physical possession of the object, that works when you're selling something to a non-Jew. Okay, and that's the simple read of our Mishnah, because our Mishnah didn't mention any exchange of money. Teda, and I'll prove it to you. The honey parsai, these Persians, Mishabi Pardashni, Lahadadi, when they send gifts to one another, it either means gifts or it could mean that basically, Rashi says, when they send a sampling, they've done a sale in the store and they send a sample of it to be tasted, okay, before they deliver the rest of the products, the Lohadribu, and then they don't reverse it once. So either this means once a gift is given and they, the other side takes possession, they don't feel that they can back out of giving the gift, okay, although that might just be a politeness thing, okay, or the other read of Rashi is once they send a sample and the guy takes possession of the sample and he likes the sample, it's a sale, then they know that the sale is final. Once you take possession, okay, at that moment the sale is final when they do machine come. So Tosa says, you know, this isn't exactly a proof, right? What, how, how Persians among themselves, what in their Dina de Mahusa, what conventions they go by, doesn't prove necessarily what Halakha recognizes final. But, you know, it's like a small support. Okay, look, this is the way they practice it anyway. Mashiach works by non Jews. Okay, um, Ravashi, Amar, Ravashi says, No, I can claim, or Tosa says, Is it I can claim, or that I really I really assert that Mashiach is not doesn't work by non Jews? The high to low Hadribahu. So, how about the fact that by their conventions they don't re return things after they take physical possession of the object? The Ramas Rucha who did not keep Mu. That's just a certain degree of like, I don't know. Arrogance. I don't want to call them arrogance, but I would say like politeness. Okay, it's a certain way, of like a derech eretz that they do that they don't return it after that point. But it doesn't mean that that is when it legally is binding. So normally the alternative of meshicha, which as again said, suggests all the types of kinyanim that are the physical taking of possession of the object. The alternative to that is kesef, the paying of the money. So Rav so Amemar is saying I don't. Uh, Ravashi is saying I don't buy in to the idea that it's kinya. It's meshicha. I say. Taking of possession is only through Kesef. This is a major debate, part, primarily in the Gemara and Baba Metzia, between Rabbi Yochan and Reish Lakish. Which Kenyan works according to the Torah for Jews? One says Kesef and the other says Meshicha. Okay, we all agree that the Rabbanon, what works for Jews, is not Kesef. It's the physical taking possession of the object, Meshicha, Hagba, Chatzor, and so on. But is that the way it is in the Torah? Or did the Torah actually have it being Kesef? And the rabbis negated that for whatever various reasons, and they said it's going to be Meshicha. So that's a debate in terms of Jews. But the, but the also impl implication of that, or what the Gemara sort of spells out in there, is that the other side of that debate is whatever you say works by Jews, it's the opposite by non-Jews. So if by Jews, according to the Torah, it's Mashiach, by non-Jews, it's Kesef. If for Jews, according to the Torah, it's Kesef, for non-Jews, it's Mashiach. So this debate, which Kenyan works for non-Jews, um, is a big debate in the Gemara. It also has huge implications for something that's coming up in the next few days, which is, what big sale to a non-Jew is coming up in the next few days? The Chiros Chametz. How do you do the Mechirat Chametz? How do we paskin about which Kenyan works for a non-Jew? So when they do the Mechirat Chametz to a non-Jew, they basically do like every type of Kenyan under the sun. First of all, you pay, you get him to pay money. That's Kesef. You get him to do an act of Meshicha. You do Chalipin. You do Chatzar. You do like, you know, you know, you know, whatever. Dina the Mahusa Dina. You do 20 different Kenyanim. Okay, but that is basically to cover your bases because it's not clear in the end what the Maskana this Gemara is. So if you look, this huge toast from Vashi Omer, Tosos tries to figure out what is our psak about Kinyanim about non-Jews. And for Tosfos, the big question is not Chametz Pesach, but because that hadn't yet become as universal yet. The big question is selling 
a piece of an animal that was about to have a baby. Because how do you get out of Bechor nowadays? The halachas of Bechor still apply. And the way you get out of Bechor is if the non-Jew has a, a, a tiny ownership in the mother, there's no halacha of Bechor of the child. So they would sell the ear of all of their female you know, sheep and cows or whatever to non-Jews, okay? So what Kenyan do you have to do to sell it? So if you look at the end of this Tosos, this big Tosos of Ashi, Tosos says like this, he says, um, you see what there's an asterisk, it's about 12 lines from the bottom, it's near where on the right hand side there's a bracket, so if you go in about four words, there's an asterisk where it says, because Rashi and Rabbeinu Tam debate what the pas psak is, it's the psak kesef or meshicha by non-Jews. So if you want to be play it safe, if you are selling a piece of an animal to a non-Jew to get out of the laws of before, you have to get the non-Jew to both pay a little money and you have to get him to do a mashicha, draw the animal. Now, mashicha doesn't work in a public domain. Mashicha only works on like in a side alley or mashicha into his actual domain itself. And let's say the non-Jew doesn't have his own domain. I don't know why, and you can't find a side alley that's considered a non-public domain. So look, it's already like this idea of doing the, all of these crazy manipulations to do these pseudo sales already started in Tosos. So first you gotta do two steps. First I gotta sell you, the non-Jew, a room in my house. Go to a Kenyan on that room. Okay, that's a Kenyan on, on, you know, on a uh, on a physical property, you know, on like real estate. Okay, so that's number one. So you got to do Kesef and Chatzer, Kesef and Meshicha. Now he goes on, how much of the animal does he have to own? This is already off top, even more off topic. I just want to read it. He has to own enough of the animal that would turn it into a trefa if it was removed. The eagle man damar afilu ozno even the ear. Benir la hachmir la hachnos over kochavim davar shosu so trefa. He should be machmir. He go on harea sell him the lungs. Varosh mina beimer the head. Of course, those things have real value. Okay, omina ubar or sell him a little piece of the fetus. It's a kishihib muberet, etc., etc. Okay, and then he and then he says, but he doesn't have to pay. I should read the next line because it's similar to mechiros chametz. Even as although we're doing kesef, it's enough to pay a to pay a symbolic amount of money. He doesn't have to give the amount of money that the thing is actually worth. Okay, which is like we do. We don't get the non-Jew to pay a hundred thousand dollars or whatever. Okay, amnam ain't tzar sheitein of kochavi mos shaveh rosh haraya. You don't have to pay the amount, the actual value of the head or the lungs. El asadu sheitein bepruta. Just give a pruta. Even though it's worth many, many times as much. You don't have to worry. Oh, it's not serious. He only gave a dollar. We know that even though the Jew is only getting a dollar, he really wants the non-Jew to own the lungs in order to get out of the halach of Bechor. Okay, so here you go. I just thought it was so appropriate. We're in the season of Mechir Eschamet and all of this, like, you know, harama and this pseudo sale, you know, and you do all these other things. You don't pay the full amount, but you do all these kinyanim in order to go ahead and to sell it, which, yes, it was, which, 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 which now I just have to tell the joke that I love, which is so a. Uh, uh, I'm not sure I should tell this on, on, on air, but I'll tell it anyway. Okay, I can't, I can't stop myself. So a, a Reform, conservative, and orthodox rabbi get together, and they decide, we got to come up with some halacha we can all agree upon. Okay, something that we all agree, like, you know, so so they say, ah, you know, let's, look, let's all agree that we think that it's us or to smoke, you know, because that's a health hazard. We can all understand that even from a purely humanistic perspective or whatever, you know, that we shouldn't be allowed to smoke, or whatever. So fuck, they all pask in, they come up with a psak, it's us or to smoke. Okay, a month later, they all bump into each other on the street and they're all smoking cigarettes. So they say, what do you mean? I thought we all came to this psak. So they turn to the reform rabbi and he says, well, it's true, but you know, at the end of the day, I think the, the key is really people making autonomous decisions and therefore, you know, that's, therefore, even, even 
though that was our decision, everybody should be, you know, should have that freedom. So they turned to the conservative rabbi and say, what's your story? He said, well, yeah, but you know, if you looked at the historical context of our original ruling and, you know, you read all of the various manuscripts and the records or whatever, there's enough room to say that it's allowed. So they turned to the Orthodox rabbis and say, okay, but what's your excuse? So he says, I don't know why you're giving me a hard time. I sold my lungs to a non-Jew. <laughs> All right, so there you go. Then I'm done. Anyway, there you go, right into selling the logs. All right, anyway, moving back to the Gemara. <laughs> All right, back to the Gemara. Uh, where we go? Okay, now, I'm a Ravashi. You know me to love. How do I, what says Ravashi, where do I get this idea from that it goes by Kesef and it does not go by uh, by Mashiach? Okay, for, from an Um And again, the Mishnah, the simple root of the read of the Mishnah is, is Mashiach. There's no money, Kesef mentioned in the Mishnah. So Ravashi says, where do I get this from? Rav said to these wine sellers, uh, when you are basically measuring out wine to the non-Jews, get them to pay the money first, and then measure out the wine. So get the money up front. So Rav emphasizes money. So the shot reading of Rav is, is that money finalizes the sale. Then be my guest. Sell them whatever you're going to sell them. They already own the wine. You're not concerned that they'll handle it. Okay. Now let's say they they don't have any cash on them. What are you supposed to do? Here's the solution. They don't have cash on them. Here's what I want you to do. Okay. Ozfinuhu, lend them the money they need for the sale. In the end of the day, it's going to be on credit anyway. But what you'll the way you make it on credit is give them the twenty bucks. Have them give you the twenty bucks back. Now they bought it with Kesef, and now they owe you twenty bucks rather than just saying you're buying it on credit. Have them actually pay the cash by you lending them the cash. Okay? So, um, uh, so first lend them the money, then take the cash from them. So that it's just, they just owe you the money, but they've actually paid in cash. The ilo of Disuhachi, if you don't do this, if they take possession without taking the money, so. When they get now take physical possession, the sale is in final. It becomes in their it, while it's still your wine. When you finally get paid, you're taking the money of Yenesech. Very clear explanation. It's almost explicit that it's the money that finalizes the transaction, right? So it's very clear. Whatever the shot of the Mishnah is, it seems very clear that Ra at least is of the position that that money with non-Jews is what finalizes the transaction. So that's a pretty good support to Rav Ashdi's position. So and if you think that what you need is the physical possession of the object, so so he says, I don't understand why you need to pay the money up front. Who needs to pay the money? As soon, from the moment they draw the wine to them, or it's in their vessel, at that second, they own it. And it won't become Yenesech until they touch it, or they have an opportunity to touch it, which is a second later that they take physical possession. So why is Rav so worried that the money be paid? As long as Mashiach is Kona, like we read our Mishnah, if the price is set and Mashiach is Kona, they own it, but a second before they have an opportunity to make it forbidden, just by physical taking of possession. Why does Rav care about the money? So that's a very good point. Rav clearly seems to be feeling physical possession does not work. It's the money that makes it final. Okay? So the Gemara says, like, so the Gemara has an answer to this. If they're pouring the wine into a Jew's flask, okay, hachanami, you'd be right. You wouldn't have to pay the money. I could, you know, and it's just the physical drawing of the wine to them would finalize the sale before they had a second, before they had a moment to touch it. Lo tzricha, you need it. You're pouring into the vessel of a non-Jew. Now, big deal. That all the more reason he should own it the minute it hits the vessel. If it's his vessel, ah, but here's the problem. Problem is, in the non-Jew's wine flask is a little leftover wine from the last time he used it. Okay, so what you're doing here is here, here he is in the store, right, with his with 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 his bottle, his wine flask. Here you are. You're pouring this wine from the barrel right into the wine flask, but there's a little bit of drops down here. Okay, so it's going to, you're go, he's going to take possession. It's true, he doesn't have a, at this moment, he can't touch it. Okay, and we assume he can't touch it and he'll take possession 
from the time it hits the bottom. And then it'll be his before he has a chance to touch it. But when it's hitting the bottom, it's mixing with those drops of wine that's forbidden. Okay, and ye nesach is usher b'mashehu. So at the moment, it is becoming ye nesach sort of at the moment, if you want to say a, a, a millisecond, because it hits the drops maybe before it hits the bottom of the vessel. Okay, it's becoming ye nesach a millisecond before he owns it or at the same time that he's owning it. Okay, and then it's a problem. Then it's like your ye nesach that you're selling to me. Okay, because he, he needs to own it before it becomes ye nesach. So that's the problem. Okay, and that's why Rav said the way you get out of this is you have him pay up front. Then he owns it before you poured it. So the, the response is, and the way this way tells us the response, you're right from that teaching of Rav. It sounds like money finalizes the sale because Rav says, have pay up front and you'll solve the problem. But that doesn't mean that money is the only way a non-Jew can take possession. A non-Jew can also take possession by Mashiach. If that's true, why is this a problem? If even if he hasn't paid the money, doesn't he own it before he can touch it? And the answer is no. If he hasn't paid the money, this is a problem because he, it becomes ye nesach before he owns it. We could say you have both options to take possession, money and mashicha, but in this case, it's, a, it's ye nesach before he owns it because when it hits those drops, before it hits the bottom of the vessel, it's already a problem. Okay? So now the Gemara says like this. The Chachayah Barami Lamanadavi Kachavah. So the Gemara says, Sov sov kimata la avira de mana kanya, ye nesach lo havea de mati la asa de mana. Okay, so I said it only becomes, he only owns it when it hits the bottom of the vessel. But the Gemara says it's not true. Once it enters the airspace of the vessel, that's Kenyan Kli. Okay, so Kenyan Kli works in the airspace. So it's his, and it only becomes, if Mashiach were to be Kona, this shouldn't be a problem, because it would be his, and here, and it only becomes ye nesach when it gets to the bottom. Should we therefore conclude, if this is a problem, that that something is connected by being poured? Meaning what? At the moment this hits the bottom of the vessel, which wine is forbidden? Just the wine that's mixed up with those drops? Or because this wine at the bottom is forbidden, all of this wine at the top is forbidden as well. That's nitzokhibor. It's all considered one unit. So the Gemara says, I could explain, assuming that Meshicha and Kli is Kona. And the question is, so if Meshicha and Kli is Kona, why doesn't he take possession here before it's a problem? And your answer is because there's some wine at the bottom. But then the question is, but that but this wine should still, he should still be Kona. I could explain that the reason he's not Kona this wine before it becomes a problem is because it's all connected to the drops at the bottom. It's a so that could be your explanation about why this would be a problem, but we don't want to be forced to conclude needs of Klippo. We want to leave that as an open question. It's not clear how we rule about that question. So the only way you'll be able to explain why this is a problem is if you say Nitzo Chibor. But do we really want to be forced to say that? So Shema Mina Nitzo Chibor, should we therefore have to conclude that need, that poor it is a connection? No. No, not necessarily. I'll give you another way to explain why this would be a problem. Okay, You're right. If he was holding on to the vessel, then the only way to explain why it would be a problem before he would be kona it would be the principle of nitzo kribor. It's all connected by the pouring. In our case, we need it. Okay, so here's the question. You're assuming, why does this work? I, might, I think I jumped the gun a little bit. Why your question that he should be conated in the airspace? It's not yet the issue of a Kenyan Kli. I, I jumped ahead a little. The more it gets to that. At this stage, it's a Kenyan of Hagba. He's holding on. That's my picture of a hand. Mm -hmm. He's holding on to the vessel, okay? And therefore, he's keeping the wine off of the ground. He's being Magbi of the wine. The wine is suspended because he's holding it onto it. Okay, so that's why we assumed it worked because of Hagba. Although I must tell you, I don't exactly get why we were assuming in the airspace it works because of Hagba, because then it's in the airspace of something I'm holding, but I'm not supporting the wine until it hits the bottom. But anyway, the Gemara says, your assumption that this should be Konet when it gets to the airspace, and therefore you said, so then it should be okay. Okay, that would be true if he's holding on to it. But in our case, he's not holding on to it. Here it is, it's on the counter, okay? So his vessel is on the counter and he's not holding on to it. And in that case, he's not Kona in the airspace. Okay? And that's why, presumably, he's only going to be Kona when it hits the bottom. 
and therefore it's already going to be yein nesach. And that's why this is a problem. He won't be able to take possession before it becomes a problem. Okay? So the Gemara says, if he was holding on to it, you'd be right that it, he, he should be able to take possession and save it from being a problem. Lo, Tzricha, you needed the Manach Ara, okay, that it's on the ground. And since it's on the ground, he only takes possession when it hits the bottom. And therefore, at that stage, it's already, even without saying Nitzel Chibur, possession of, the, of it is only at the bottom of the vessel. And at that stage, it's missing with the drops of wine, and it's already a problem of Yei So that's why Rav said you had to pay the money first. If you didn't pay the money first, even if we were to assume that Mashiach were to also work by a non-Jew, he would not take possession early enough. Because possession would only happen when it hit the bottom, and when it hits the bottom, it's all it's already mixed with the other drops that were there from beforehand, and it's yein nesach. Okay? So that's why here. Let me put here. I'll, I'll put in these are the problematic drops. I finally found myself another cult. Okay, anyway. All right, so the Gemara says like this. That's how we explain why you have to pay the money up front. Okay, so the Gemara says, Vitikni uh, Lake Kalav. Okay, so so what says the Gemara? Why is that it's still not taking possession because of the Kli? And presumably, even if he's not holding it, and even if it's not Hagba, let it work through Kenyan Kli. So the Gemara says, Shmas, should, we, shmas mina, should we hear from this? that the reason it doesn't work by a Kenyan Kli is maybe because you're in the juice store. So that's a debate. If I put stuff in my bag and I'm in your, and I'm, and I'm, I'm in your domain, does, my, does it being in my bag take possession? Okay, that's a general question of Kenyan Kli. Kli will work if we're in neither of our domains, if we're in like a side street, then it's in my bag, I take possession, or in my picture. But what about if we're in a, your domain? You're the seller. So since it's fundamentally your store, just because it's in my bag, it doesn't yet mean that I own it, maybe. Does Kenyan Kli work? So the Gemara is saying, and maybe what the Gemara is suggesting here is, maybe we can even forget about the drops at the bottom. Okay? The point is, even if Mashiach works, the reason that this he doesn't take possession yet is because he's not holding on to it, so it's not Hagba. It's it's a Kli in the seller's domain, so it doesn't work Kenyan Kli. So you get this scenario, he comes, he puts his pitcher down. The guy pours the wine in. He's not holding the pitcher, it's not Hagba. He's not, uh, it's, it's a, his Kli in the guy's store, it's not a Kenyan Kli. So maybe we could even forget about, you know, the drops of wine or something, and we could say that it doesn't work because he doesn't take possession yet, and now he has access to touch it before he's been able to do a Kenyan on it. Okay, so that could be the explanation. May, Rav says pay the money first because money will work. Does that prove that Mashiach doesn't work? No, maybe Mashiach does work, and he just hasn't taken possession yet. There's no Hagba, there's no Kli, and that's why, and that's why it's going to become Yei Nesach before he takes possession. Okay, but the Gemara says, but that'll only work if you say Kenyan Kli doesn't work in the, in the seller's domain. Do we really want to conclude that way? Shmas mina, should we conclude from this? That the vessels of the purchaser don't work with the Kenyan Kli in the seller's domain, because that's how you'll explain that he's not Kone yet. Lo Kana Lo No, you don't have to come to that conclusion. Lo Kana Lo I could tell you in general, Kenyan Kli would work even in the seller's domain. There is some holding back of the wine on the lip of the vessel. Okay, the kama kama in okay, and the and every little bit first becomes a problem. So what we're basically doing is we're saying it's a variation of what we said before. Maybe he would be kona kinyan kli. So our question is, if he's kona kinyan kli, right? Then maybe he should be kona the minute it hits the airspace, and then he owns it before it becomes and mixes with those drops of wine on the bottom. So what we're saying now is, now here's the story. There's like a lip to this, and there is some drops of wine, of, of the wine from the last time he used it, but it's still the non-Jews vessel, right there on the lip. And as he's pouring the wine, his wine, it gets mixed up with the usser wine before it gets into the airspace, okay? So in that scenario, all right, if you paid the money up front, then he owns it before it becomes a problem. 
But if he didn't pay the money up front, even if Mashiach works and Kli works and Abba works and all those things work, here it's a problem because the Kenyan only happens when it hits the airspace and a second before it hits the airspace, it's mixing with forbidden wine. Okay? So that's why Rav wants you to pay the money up front because even because money definitely works according to Rav. And, but even if Mashiach also works, there's not a mo- here it becomes forbidden before the Mashiach takes place. Okay, and before the Kli takes place. Okay, so now the Gemara says, Ukiman. Okay, good. We got all that. But one minute. Why is this a problem? Because here, you're not selling him his drops of wine. You're selling him your wine. So let's say I poured my my you know gallon of wine into his vessel, and there was tiny, tiny drops of Yen Nesach from his vessel that weren't Batel, okay? 0.0001%. So it's not Batel. Yen Nesach is Asr B'mashev. But why can't he pay me for my wine? He's not paying me for the Yen Nesach. Yen Nesach was his to begin with. Do you understand the question? Even if the wine is now Asr because of a Ta'arovet, there's a mixture of Yen Nesach there, the only thing that's forbidden in that mixture are the tiny drops of wine. Why can't I get him to pay me for my wine, which is mutter? It's true you can't drink any of it because it all has tiny little drops of yin nesach, but, if he, but I'm not getting enough from those drops. He's not paying me for those drops. He's paying me for my wine. So this actually is a debate of Rabbi Shimon Gamliel and the Chachamim. When you have a mixture of yin nesach and mutter wine, okay, and it's Aser B'mashu and the whole thing, are you allowed to sell it to a non-Jew? Like if I have 10 gallons of mutter wine and one gallon of yenesach mixed up and it's a dollar a gallon, can I sell the whole thing to a non-Jew for $10? Because I could argue, I'm not benefiting from the after wine. I'm just getting paid for the mutter wine. Or do you now look at the whole thing as after wine and you can't sell any of it, okay, for, for any price? So that's a debate of a community on the Chacham. So the Gemara says, if you're going to say this is a problem, it means, well, come on, who is this going like? The local of Leo, not like Rabbi Shimon Leo. That even in a forbidden mixture, you can sell it and get paid for the heter wine. So if that's true, this shouldn't be a problem. Because yes, the whole mixture is forbidden, but he could still pay you for the heter wine. So should we conclude from this that we don't rule like Rabbi Shimon Gamliel? And the general assumption is that we will. Whenever Rabbi Shimon gives a ruling in a Mishnah, we rule like him. Okay, so is that the only way now to read this? So the Gemara says, so the Gemara says, uh, uh, um, yes, it is. Not, yes, you're correct. It's not like Reb Shimon Gamliel, but that's not a problem. Even if in general we rule like Reb Shimon Gamliel, we're trying to explain Rav's position. Hama Rav, Rav says, When do we rule like Reb Gamliel? If it's not one big uniform mixture, if I have 10 barrels of kosher wine and one barrel of, 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 of non-kosher, and I don't know which is which, if they get mixed up, I can sell it to the non and say, pay me for 10 barrels. Okay? Because then we could say, like, I'm not even really selling him the barrel. Whichever barrel is the non-kosher one, that's the one I didn't sell him. I sold him the rest. But when it's all mixed up into liquid, then I can't say I'm not selling him those three drops. They, they're not separated off from the other drops. Okay? So there, you're not allowed to sell it at all. So yes, according to Rav, we'll rule like with King Amiel when barrels get mixed up. But when wine gets mixed up, like this case, you're not allowed to say, I'm selling it to you minus the value of the trafe wine. The whole thing is seen as one unit. The whole thing is now forbidden because it's a mixture. And you can't sell any of it. Okay? So that was very, very long. So now what we've done is we've taken a statement of Rav who basically has made it crystal clear that for him, money is what finalizes the sale. And he says, when you're selling wine to a non-Jew, make sure to get paid the cash up front. Okay. So it's sort of like that line, in God we trust, all others pay cash. Okay. So anyway, so make sure you get the cash up front. Okay. And Rav makes it very clear that cash finalizes the sale. And what we're trying to say, because we're trying to assert that it's about Mashiach, is that maybe cash also finalizes the sale for Rav, but maybe Mashiach also does it. If Mashiach also does it, why do why do you need to pay the cash? Why does he take possession before he has a chance to touch it? And the basic answer is because we're dealing in a scenario that there are tiny little droplets of wine at the edge, and that's why the wine becomes forbidden before he gets a chance to take possession. And once there's a little bit of trafe wine mixed up, you can't sell any of the wine, okay? So that's how we try to explain that this could work 
with an idea that Mashiach also is a form of Kenyan, and nevertheless, this becomes problematic before the Mashiach takes place. But the simple sense of Rav is that it's all about Kesef, it's not about Mashiach. Okay, so now the Gemara is going to move on to other cases to try to prove which, which is the one that does the Kenyan. Okay, so now this is like this. Meisve, I'll ask you. You're buying scrap metal from a non-Jew. And amongst the scrap metal, you find some discarded uh, little metal idols, okay, which is Asr Behana. If you did Mashiach before you paid the cash, then you can return it, okay? If, however, you paid the cash and then you did the Mashiach, then you already own it. So in that case, you can't return the idol and get your money back because then now you own the idol, Okay, and now if you get your money back, you'll be getting benefit, you'll be selling an idol. Okay, so in that case, now what does it sound like? It sounds like what makes the difference is whether you've paid the cash or not, right? So if you've paid the cash, if you haven't paid the cash, you can return it. So it sounds like if you haven't paid the cash, the sale isn't final. Give back the, give back the idol and deduct it from the price. But if you've paid the cash and the sale is final, now you can't sell back, give back the idol because you'd be selling it back and you'd be getting benefit. All right, is that clear? So the key in this Mishnah is, have you paid the cash or not? So that makes it sound very clear that cash is what finalizes the sale. Now, if Mashiach actually does take possession, so in the first case where you haven't paid the cash, but you've done Mashiach, why are you entitled to return it? All right, is that clear to everybody? You took the you took the scrap metal, you haven't paid it, and you haven't paid it. It says if you haven't paid cash yet, you can return the idol. Why? Don't you already own the idol? And now you're getting hana from uh, from an idol? So so I'm so I'm buying shum demechzi kimekartos. Okay, because it looks like what's what do you mean it looks like? Because it is. It is a mechartos. You never intended to buy the idol. So the yes, Mashiach could be Kone. And the reason you're allowed to return the idol even after you did Mashiach was because the idol was a mistake. You never intended to take possession of the idol. Of course, the point is, if that's true, then even, even after you've paid the cash, you should be allowed to return the idol because you never intended to take possession of the idol. So I'm a Rava. So Rava said, one minute. If what's going on here is not whether you were Kona or not, but that it was a Mechatos, who cares whether it's before or after you paid money? I'm a Rava. The whole thing is a mekartos, according to Abaye. So if you can return it after Mashiach, you should be able to return it after Mashiach and having paid money. The whole thing is a mekartos. Okay, we'll go, let's go with this. Reisha visei for mekartos. Fine, yes. The reason you can return it is, it's all a mekartos. The first case and the second case. So then why does it matter if you've paid money or not? Not whether you've done the Kenyan. The Kenyan you'll, you'll have done from the type of time of Mashiach. And you can return it because of mekartos. So why does it matter if you paid money? Here's why it matters. Reisha, Dulo Yoiv Zuse, in the first case, you you it's Mechotos. Yes, you own all the rest of the metal. You don't own the idol, Mechotos. But because you haven't paid money, you can return the idol. It doesn't look like you're selling an idol. You're giving him back his idol, and he's not giving you any money. You're just paying him less, right? You got it? You agreed on $1,000 for the scrap metal. The idol is $10 worth of metal. So in the first case, you didn't pay the money. You give him back the idol. And when you get around to paying the money, you only pay $990. That does not look like you sold him an idol. You just gave him back the idol and said this wasn't part of the sale. Okay? That's if the money hasn't been paid yet. But Seifa, the Yaisus, in the first case, you already gave him the $1,000. You're going to give him back the idol. And what are you going to ask for? Give me back $10. So in that case, you're giving him an idol and you're getting $10. It looks like you're selling him an idol. It's like you're selling him an idol. So that's a very nice read of the bright. He says, look, in neither case, we could say Mashiach is Kone. You took possession of all the metal. But in neither case did you take possession of the idol. That was a mistake. So the only issue of whether the money has been paid is an issue of whether returning the idol looks like selling the idol or not. So that's the only issue. But in terms of Kenyan, that all takes place from the time of Mashiach. Okay, so I'm a, so we're st we still haven't f come to a conclusion whether it's Mashiach or Kesef. So the elder Mark Kishisha said to Rav Ashi, Tashma, let's come and prove it from here. Our Mishnah, finally, you sold wine to a non-Jew. 
Pasach, I tell him, my God, if you have fixed the price and then he did Mashiach, it's okay. He took possession before he could touch it. And so now, why is that? Now, if Mashiach doesn't work, okay, why is that okay? He hasn't paid the money yet, and he'll handle it before he's paid the money, and he'll make it forbidden. So, am I dumb of Mutarim? So the Mar says, no. Hach of my eskina and the akim lay dinar. So of course that's a very hard read of the Mishnah. And the case is, is basically he prepaid for the wine. In our Mishnah, the guy we're already talking that he gave the money. Okay, so then it's very bizarre. If he gave the money, who cares whether you were pasak or not not pasak? So the point is like this: even though he gave the money, he didn't finalize the sale until you told him how much the price was. Here's ten dollars. How much does it? How much are you? It's a little bizarre. You paid the money before you even heard how much the price was. So I guess so, maybe. But it's still, you haven't heard the price. So in, although our mission seems to make it clear that the key is madad, once the price is fixed, it's, it's the mashicha. We're actually de-emphasizing the madad, and what we're actually sort of saying, it, emphasizing is money has been paid. That's what's going to finalize the sale. That'll finalize the sale once the price gets fixed. So if basically. He took possession of it. That's not the Kenyan Mashiach. The Kenyan is money. Before the price was fixed, then he had an opportunity to handle it before before the sale was final. That's a problem. But if he if the price was fixed and then he took possession, so then the sale was final before he had a chance to handle it. The finalizing of the sale was not the madad. The finalizing of the sale was the money that had been prepaid. Okay, so how about skin and the akdim leidina? So the Gemara says, "Ihachi, if that's true, aim a sefer." Let's look at the end of the Mishnah. Madad actually pasak tamavasurim. If it was measured before the price was fixed, it's forbidden. Be the kadim leidina. So I've already given you the answer to this. I'm aydam avasurim. If it was prepaid, why is it any case a problem in the Mishnah? So the answer is, is because even though it was prepaid, the sale wasn't final until you know the price. Amalei, which is what he says back, Uli didachta marcha meshicha bovit kochal mikonet. So he said back, and according to you, you read the Mishnah that madad is the Kenyan, madad is meshicha. So amai reisha dam of mutar and besefer dam of Again, what's the difference about the reisha and the sefer? In both cases, he did meshicha. So clearly, somehow, the idea of fixing a price interacts with the act of Kenyan. Whether the act of Kenyan is Mashiach or whether the act of Kenyan is Kesef, neither act of Kenyan is final until you know the price. Okay? So even if you read the Mishnah that Medida is the act of Kenyan, why does it need Pasak? Because Pasak, fixing the price, you know, you know, uh, is a necessary for the act of Kenyan to finalize the sale. So, Amai Reisha Dhamma Mutar Mesefer Dhamma Basur, Elamai Sachamim, or what do you say? Pasak Sam Chadaite. Once the price is fixed, then. He has, you know, he then he, he you know, he, he finalizes his, his intent to purchase it. Okay. Lo pasak, lo sam chadaite. Before the price is fixed, even though you did a mashiach, the sale isn't final. Yeah, because, you, what? You have to add that according to this explanation, you need to do both pasak and madad to be that right. Well, that, that is what the mission is. The mission says in both cases you were madad. When it's with pasak, the sale is final. When it's not yet pasak, the sale isn't final. Right, so if you if you explain the mashiach kona, then then the the role that Madad plays in the whole process makes sense because Madad, Madad is part, the act of kidney. Right, but if according right. to the dinar explanation, you have to say that. It makes sense, but Fulgmirudad requires Pasak and Madad. And oh, like no, 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 no. Purchase. No, it requires, no. If you read it that the Kenyan is done through the prepaying of the money, and plus the Pasak, the reason Madad is mentioned is not for the act of Kenyan, but at what stage does the Nanju have access? Mm. Okay? If it was Pasak, so then it was final, and then it's Madad, so he got access after it was final. But if it was Madad and then it was Pasak, he got access before it was final. Mm. So, the, so the way, how you read Madad in the Mishnah depends on these two reads. If it's Mashicha, Madad is the act of the Kenyan. If it's Kesef, which hasn't been stated, Madad is the moment of access. Okay? So he says, so so the Didi Nami, so one minute. Nami, Avagav, the cutting lay dinar, Pasak Sam Chadaiti, Lo Pasak Lo Sam Chadaiti. He says, I don't have any problem explaining the Mishnah. The act of Kenyan is either Kesef, which wasn't mentioned, which is bizarre that it's not mentioned, okay, or it's Madad. But either way, the, the what finalizes it is the, what do you call it, is the, um, it, you know, is the Pasak. And that's how to read the Mishnah. If the Pasak happened before you had access, you're good. If the Pasak happened after you had access, you're not good. Okay, so I guess. Uh, all right, let's read one more line. No, no, they're not in yet, so we'll read one more line. I only have Tashma, come in here. 
I'll try to prove it from here. The Amar Rebbe Chiyah Bar Avam Rebbe Yochanan Ben Noach Nera Gal Pachos Mishvei Pruta Veloni Tanli Hishava. If a Ben Noach steals less than a Pruta, that's considered Gneva, and he'd be Nera because any of the Shevets is Bnei Noach they're executed for. Okay, and there's no. It, it doesn't make sense to return it because the Jew would be Mochel on it. It's less than a Pruta. That's not money that gets returned in Jewish court. But nevertheless, it's considered Gneva or Gzela for non-Jews. Now, what does that have to do with anything? Now, if Meshich is in Kone, am I Nerag? Why is he Nerag? Now, what type of question is that? What do you mean, why is he Nerag? So Rashi explains it the following way. Because if any you ever learned Hilchas Geneva or Gzela, the act of Geneva and Gzela is only completed when a Masa Kenyan is done, a Hagba, a Meshich, and so on. So here we have a scenario where if you say the only thing that's Kone for a non Jew is Kesef, well, there's no Kesef when you're stealing it. Okay, but that raises other questions. How can you give a gift to a non-Jew if you need Kesef, okay, right? If you always need Kesef. So Tosus actually disagrees. Tosus says you only need Kesef in a monetary, in a purchase, okay? In cases like a gift or cases like theft, okay, it would just, you would, everybody would agree you wouldn't need Kesef. But let's go for Rashi right now. So for Rashi, the question is, it's not a Maisa Geneva. There was no Masa Kenyan. And Maisa Geneva needs a Masa Kenyan. And since non-Jews, it always needs money. There was no Masa Kenyan. So why is he narrow? Okay, he never really stole it. So, so the answer is, Mishum Tsari Li Israel. No, even if he technically didn't steal it, he did enough by keeping it out of the possession of the Jew and he caused the Jew's anguish. I don't have access to my car. I don't care whether technically you say you've managed to keep it away from me because, oh, well, I didn't do a Masa Kenyan yet. Okay, I mean, you can imagine cases, right? We have cases like that. I could lock you out of your house and prevent you from getting in. And technically, I didn't do a Geneva. I didn't take possession of the object. I didn't do a Masa Kenyan. So it says, you know what? Fine. Maybe it wasn't a Masa Kenyan, but it's enough of a Geneva by keeping the object away that it's considered Geneva or Gzela, and it still is a transgression of Gnei Noach. So the Gemara says, Umai lo nitan lihishavon. So what does it mean it can't be returned? The Eino b'toros yishavon. That it's not in the parsha of being returned because it's less than a pruta. But really, it never left the possession of the Jew because there was no Masa Kenyan ever done to it. Yahi says the Gemara, that's true, Ema Seifa. Let's look at the end of that. Let's say non Jew number two stole it from non Jew number one, Naragalel. He didn't, and now he also did an act of Geneva Gzela, and he also gets executed. But that means that non Jew number one took possession. You with me? Because otherwise he wouldn't be stealing from non Jew number one. So in the first case, I understand. You, he kept, Non-Jew number one kept it away from the Jew. That's enough of an act of Geneva. But I was safe in my oven. But in the second case, non-Jew number two didn't hurt Jew. He only hurt non-Jew number one. So what did non-Jew number two do? It's not a Geneva. He didn't hurt the Jewish access. So if the, it makes it clear that non-Jew number one through his Geneva took possession of it, and Nanju number two now stole it from Nanju number one. So you see that Mashiach works. Shma Mina. So that actually seems to be the conclusion of the Gemara. Of course, the problem is, is that really only proved it in a case where it was not transactional to begin with, right? And Tosu says, just because we agree that a Nanju could take possession by a Matana or by Geneva or Gazela without Kesef, it doesn't mean that in an act of transaction, it wouldn't need Kesef. But anyway, the Gemara seems to conclude, at least for here, that Mashiach is what works for a non-Jew. And that okay. has to be less than Pruta only to find...